We're in part two of a series that I'm real excited about. Undeniable part two. Today we're going to talk about a new generation. Uh, as we're getting ready, remind me of a story of this woman. She came home to find her husband, uh, and there he was in the house with the fly swatter. And, and, and she said, what are you doing? He said, I'm hunting flies. Hmm? She said, oh, have you killed any? Yep, he said, three males, two females. <laughs> she was intrigued. She said, well, so how, how can you tell? He quickly responded, well, three were on the TV and two were on the phone. <laughs> there you go. If you have your Bible, and I hope you do today, we're going to do a little bit of reading in Judges chapter 6. Right there in the first part of your Bible, if you're looking, you can hunt and find it there. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. How about right there? People are wondering, I wonder if he's going to get it right. I was wondering if I was going to get it right as well. It says in, verse, in chapter 6, verse 1, it says, The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. The Midianites were so cruel that the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in the mountains, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, marauders from Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east would attack Israel, camping in the land and destroying crops as far away as Gaza. They left the Israelites with nothing to eat, taking all the sheep, goats, cattle, and donkeys. These enemy hordes coming with their livestock and tents were as thick as locusts. They arrived on droves of camels, too numerous to count. And they stayed until the land was stripped bare. So Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. When they cried out to the Lord... Because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites, and he said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of slavery in Egypt. I rescued you from the Egyptians and from all who oppressed you. I drove up to your enemies and gave you their land. I told you, I am the Lord, your God. You must not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live. But you have not listened to me. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash of the clan of Abiezer. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of the winepress to hide the grain from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. But Lord Gideon replied, How can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. Then the Lord said to him, I will be with you, and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. And Gideon replied, if you are truly going to help me, show me a sign to prove that it is really the Lord speaking to me. Don't go away until I come back and bring my offering to you. He answered, I will stay here until you return. <laughs> Gideon hurried home. He cooked a young goat with a basket of flour. He baked some bread without yeast. Then carrying the meat in a basket and the broth in a pot, he brought them out and presented them to the angel who was under the great tree. The angel of God said to him, Place the meat and the unleavened bread on this rock and pour the broth over it. And Gideon did as he was told. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the bread with the tip of the staff in his hand, and the 
Flame, fire flamed up from the rock and consumed all he had brought. And the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that the angel of the Lord, it was the angel of the Lord, he cried out, O oh, sovereign Lord, I'm doomed. I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. It is all right, the Lord replied. Do not be afraid, you will not die. And Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and named it Yahweh Shalom, which means the Lord is peace. The altar remains in Ophrah in the land of Abiazer to this day. You know, we celebrate a big holiday this week, July 4th, and I've just got to be really honest with you. I love our country. I, I have a respect. In spite, of her, in spite of her many faults and failures, I, I will tell you oftentimes I, I get goosebumps or I'll cry at the national anthem. But, you know, as I look at that, I also understand some of the things that happen in our country that we're having difficulty with. Because when we talk about this holiday, there's one word that comes to mind, and that word is freedom. But I want us to understand something today. Freedom without responsibility is a trap. It doesn't bring happiness. If you think that freedom brings happiness without responsibility, you're entirely wrong, and you've missed the whole of the gospel. See, people can say, I can say what I want, I can print what I want, I can do what I want, I can be who I want to be. But can I tell you something about true love? True love doesn't have freedom of expression. L let me say that again so you catch this. Uh, you, true love doesn't have freedom of expression. How many of you are married? Raise your hand. Let, let me explain that. Just because you think something doesn't mean you always say it. Come on now. Because that can get you in big trouble. And sometimes the Word of God tells us that love restrains. So you understand there is a responsibility that comes with freedom. See, and when we understand love, what that means is we take in consideration, and this is what's been lost in the freedom of our country. I love and care for you more than I love and care for myself. So therefore, I don't have to express my freedom because I love and care for you more than I care for myself. When we come back to our passage today, in verse number one, it says, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. And I want us to understand, if you'll understand that expression later on, what happens when the prophet talks to them, doing evil in the Lord's sight in that day meant that they were worshiping idols. But I want you to understand something. Worshiping idols is more than just bowing down to these graven Im images. What idol worship was in that day and what it is today is idol worship was an enabler and excuse for sinful behavior. Because, you, you know, the one thing about idols, they don't demand holiness. Can I tell you something? Your television doesn't demand holiness. Your iPad, your iPhone doesn't demand holiness. Come on now. And idol worship made a way for sexual immorality, promiscuity, revenge, hate, and even promised prosperity. But as we read this passage, we understand that there's a great cost for that. And in the middle of all these things happening that we understand, even Jesus said this of the enemy. It says he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And we look at this picture of the Midianites and what they do. They come and they steal, they kill, and they destroy. But in the middle of this, something happens. It says, then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. This is what I love right here. How many of you remember that we read out of Exodus what God said about himself? I am long-suffering and full of mercy. That means that I'm not certain where the line is, but I, I, can I tell you? Boy, it's a long line that he, he, he continues to forgive. How many of you know that he continues to forgive? How, how many of you have messed up this week? How many of you have messed up this morning? All right. You understand, he's full of grace and mercy. 
But this just wasn't just a personal issue. It wasn't a family issue. It wasn't a regional issue. This became a, a national issue. And what we need to understand about this, and it's so important in the Word of God, because there is this under, underflow of theology going on in the world as we know it today. And it so undermines prayer. And that is this, is that we, we believe so much in the sovereignty of God that He's going to do what He wants to do that we have discounted prayer for what it ought to be. Can I tell you something? Jesus said, all you have to do is ask. In fact, James chapter 5, verse 16 speaks to us as believers. And he says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. And then James talks about Elijah and his humanity and how he prayed that it wouldn't rain. And then he prayed that it would rain. And he's talking about something that relates to us that through and by great faith... Can I tell you something? There can be great results. And what I found in the world that we live in today is oftentimes we have set God by the wayside and we said, well, I guess that's just the way it's supposed to be. Can I tell you something? Or let me ask you something better yet. Have you prayed about it? Have you asked God? Because can I tell you something? He's full of grace and mercy and he does still intervene. And so we come into this world that we're living in. One thing that I, I dislike about the world is much negativity and false news there is that especially in the church, no one wants to be negative. Let's embrace the world and be happy. But you know what? Sometimes you have to recognize the problem. Even Jesus, when, when we talked about it last week, uh, when he went to the blind man, oftentimes he would ask them a very silly question. What do you want of me? Now, to us, that seems really, really silly because he's not only the son of man, he's the son of God. And doesn't he already know? Can't he already see this person is lame or blind? Can't he already understand that they can't hear him? Doesn't Jesus, is he perceptive enough to, why is he asking, what do you need of me? And many times you find the lame or the leper or the, Blind men say, I'm blind, Lord. And sometimes it's the recognition of the issue that the Israelites cried out and they said, the Midianites are overwhelming us. <sighs> Yesterday I went to the grocery store, uh, which is one of my favorite things to do. <laughs> Shelly doesn't like going to the grocery store. I like going to the grocery store. There's all kinds of interesting things at the grocery store, like ice cream <laughs> and people and, and ice cream. And I'm walking through, and this thought just comes in my mind as I'm walking through. I'm not just overwhelmed by people being lost, but a whole generation being lost. A generation being lost because... They misunderstand who God is because we come to church and we say things like God's going to have his way and do what he wants to do. And it really paints a picture of God that he's really going to do what he wants to do. And there's not much mercy and grace involved. But can I tell you something? There's a lot of mercy and grace in God. But to find it, sometimes you have to ask. And then yesterday when I got home, Shelly, I walked in the door. She says, you have to listen to this. And she was playing me a sermon. And really what the sermon was about, about this church, that essentially is going to shut down. That's what's happening. Uh, because of people and because of lives going on and the busyness of everybody, uh, there, there's just this understanding that this is what we're going to do. We're not going to have church anymore. Hey, listen, you watch online. Why don't you just stay home and watch online? And you can watch it at your convenience and do what you want to do and still be all that God wants you to be. And I thought, I began to listen. And then later on, Shelly said, she began crying at the table. She said, that really grieves me. You say, Pastor, why has it grieved? Why does it grieve you? Because let me talk to you about the New Testament church. Then we're going to get back to our story. 
The New Testament church was a place that oftentimes could be unregulated and wild. And really, that's the part about it that we are really uncomfortable with. You know, we call him the lion of the tribe of Judah, but you know what? We want to put him in a cage and domesticate him. Can I tell you, he's no domestic cat. And when we understand about the presence of God, when they would come together in the presence of God, things would happen, signs, wonders, and miracles. And each person was given a gift, but all, each person also gave a gift. And church wasn't about coming and receiving. It was to come about the participation of giving our gift that God had given to us. Yeah, there were some excess, and Paul talks about those excesses in Corinthians. And, and yeah, there was some wild, crazy stuff that were going on. And uh, we like to talk about things being in order. But can I tell you something? When the people of God got together, something happened. Yes, it was uncomfortable sometimes. Because you could have someone amongst you that might be like a prophet and read your mail. Oh, I don't like that. And church, by and large, listen to me. Maybe it wasn't a comfortable, convenient place. Listen to me. If we want church to be comfortable and convenient, then we should just have an online church. Did you hear what I just said? But I don't want church to be comfortable and convenient. Can I tell you something? I want God to show up and move. And I want him to show up in ways that are undeniably him. You say, well, I wouldn't have done it like that. And can I tell you something? That's why we're not God. It's God that made Naaman go wash in a dirty old leper, as a dirty leper down in a dirty river. We never would have done that. It's Jesus that spat and made mud. Uh, it, it's, it's God who decided that he was going to take a rebel named Saul and turn him into one of the greatest apostles in history. We wouldn't have had any of those plans. God does things in ways that aren't our ways. Can I tell you, that's okay because he's God. But as we read this story, it reminds me of this generation. It reminds me of this generation because I see this interaction between the angel of the Lord and Gideon. And he asked this question, and maybe you're asking this question today. If God is with us, where is he? If God is with us, where, where's he at? I, I've heard the stories, and people, listen, they talk about the stories all the time about how God can do this and how God can do that. Uh, if that's really true, where is he? And it kind of reminds me of this generation. Yeah, we can complain about the X generation or the Y generation or whatever you want to call the generation to come. But can I tell you something? What happens to a generation when they don't experience an undeniable God? So he says, if, we're, if he's real, why are we in this mess? See, it's not enough for a generation just to hear about an undeniable God. Prayer opens the door for God's dialogue and action. And can I tell you something? As I walked through the grocery store, this is what I came with. This generation is lost without an undeniable move of God. I know. There are all kinds of scholars and theologians and people that can speak to it that says... Well, God doesn't owe us anything, and there's not anything prophesied or said about a latter-day move of God. Can I tell you something? I'm not banking on any of that. What I'm banking on is him and his character and word where it says he's long-suffering, he's merciful, and he doesn't change. Amen. Come on now. Hey, he's not going to deny himself. And so when I thought about that, I thought about Romans chapter 15 where Paul speaks of his own ministry. 
uh, and his ministry to the Romans and how it should apply to us. And he said, I am a special messenger from Christ Jesus to you Gentiles. In other words, I am the gift that God has sent to you guys. I bring you the good news so that I may present you as an acceptable offering to God made holy by the Holy Spirit. So I have reason to be enthusiastic about all Christ Jesus has done through me in my service to God. Yet I dare not boast about anything except what Christ has done through me, bringing the Gentiles to God by my message, listen to this, and by the way I worked among them. They were convinced... By the power of miraculous signs and wonders, and by the power of God's Spirit. Listen to me. It doesn't say that they were convinced by a sermon. Does it say that? It doesn't say that he preached a six-part sermon series with lots of good illustrations, and they were convinced. It doesn't say they were convinced by a Bible college. How were they convinced? By the power of miraculous signs and wonders and by the power of God's Spirit. Can I tell you, the Lion of Judah is dangerous. And can I tell you something else? He's on the prowl. And I, I am desirous of a church, of a people, you and me that are hungry for the undeniable move of God. That we can't say, well, you know what, like I said last week, I got that parking place at the mall, that was God. <laughs> Everybody in the world laughs at us and says, that's funny. I got to raise it my work, that's God, and they all laugh at us. But you know what? When Jesus raises Lazarus out of the grave, that's undeniable. After four days, he comes walking out of the grave in grave clothes. That's undeniable. You can't say, well, you know, how did he? No, that's undeniable. So you say, Pastor, what is today's lesson? Well, it's simple because we're going to do something today. You see, I really do believe that in church we ought to pray sometimes. Listen, I know that it doesn't, it doesn't go with our formatting sometimes. We like things to be on schedule, and we say, well, Tyler starts on time, and we have the, the five-minute countdown, and then he starts on time, and then he does a couple of fast songs, and then he does a couple of slow songs, then Pastor gets up and prays, or Shelly gets up and prays, and everything works according to cue. And I don't care if God messes up our cue. You know why? Because I want to see him move in undeniable ways. I want you, listen to me, I want you to go home from church one day. And you, instead of anything about Facebook, I don't care if you ever write about the sermon, you say, I saw something today that I have never seen in my life. And it had to be God. Had nothing to do with the preacher, had nothing to do with his sermon, had nothing to do with uh, Life Community Church. It had, you understand something? I'm all about giving him all the glory. <clears throat> that I know even and of myself, huh, I, I want you to get this. Even of myself, this is not my idea. Because if you know my personality, if you know my character, you know, I say something all the time to my staff, and they can, they can rehearse it back to you. The one thing I tell them is this. I don't like surprises. Uh, what that means to them is this, is I want you to do things, take care of things, have it working on time, and I don't want there to be any surprises because you're not doing that. How many know what I'm talking about? I say that all the time. But let me tell you what I'm believing about church. I want, to, I want some surprises. You say, Pastor, you know what comes with that. There's all kinds of flakiness and stuff. Da, 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 dee, 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 dee. Can I tell you something? God can handle all that. Yeah, it gets on my nerves. I'll be honest with you. 
Yeah, it, it makes for sometimes some humorous moments in church. Because all of a sudden, you, people allow, sometimes we don't mean to, but they allow their flesh to take over instead of the spirit. Can I tell you something? And I believe this with all my heart. If it's really God, you don't have to have the attention for you. You don't have to have the attention for you because it's all him. And so we don't have to detract or say, God did this or, you know, look at me and, woo. You know, I think that we have seen plenty of that over the years. I've grown up in church. I've seen just about everything at least once. And I know a great evangelist of our day, and I was there in their midst, and they would be very demonstrative and do things, and they were in the spotlight. But can I tell you something, though, as great and good as that is, and God uses those men and their gift, I'd like to see God just move and him be him. And that we could say, you know what, that was God. That was all God. So in today's lesson, what do we have to do? We have to open our eyes and ears. And what that means is this. Maybe you need to take a walk around and open your eyes and ears and say, you understand something. This generation, they're crying out for something real. They're like Gideon. I've heard the stories. But you understand, the only thing they know about church oftentimes is a manufactured program. It's just a manufactured program. Do you know, you know what that person said in that sermon that's downplaying or downgrading his church? He said, we can't compete with mega churches. That's what he said. We can't compete with everything they have. And I told Shelly, that's exactly true. Thank God that's true. Don't want to compete. Because we have something different. We have something that is undeniable. So we have to open our eyes. We have to look around and we have to look at the world around us to understand. I want my kids to see a real move of God in this country. Did you hear what I said? In this country. Yeah, I can take them all around the world and I know what they can see all around the world. But I'm going to tell you what I believe. God can still move in America today. Come on now. How many of you believe God can still move in America today? So we need to open our eyes and ears. And here we need to see and seize the opportunity for God in his glory. We're going to do that in just a moment. And Shelley said this yesterday, and I believe this with all my heart. I believe God is raising up intercessors. And as I say that this morning, I know that there are many of you here right now that God has called you to be prayer warriors. And your life is not the same because you're not praying. Can, can I tell you something? It's time for you to pick up the mantle of being a prayer warrior again. And every day I want you to pray for this next generation. I want you to pray that God will give them undeniable signs, wonders, and miracles. That they can't deny God at all. They can't deny his spirit, his move, that they can say all day long, I've heard, and it was said, and I've read it in the books, and I've read about Smith Wigglesworth, and I've read this, but you know what? There ain't nothing like that today. My word says Jesus Christ, Hebrews 13, 8. It's my favorite scripture. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, wait a minute, and forever. Yesterday, And the New Testament church was a place of God's expression. Yeah, it was messy sometimes. It was. Yeah, it wasn't always formatted. It wasn't. But let's read what the Apostle Paul said again. Can I read it? It says to the Romans, And they were convinced by the power of miraculous signs and wonders and by the power of God's Spirit. And they were convinced. You say, Pastor, that, that kind of talk just kind of scares me. Don't let it scare you. Because you understand something. God's not afraid to show himself. God's not afraid to show himself. Because you understand something. 
the thing that, that makes us fearful is that if we become more convinced that he's real, then we're going to have to do something about our lives. The more we're convinced he's real, the more accountability we have on ourselves. And that's why people flee from the presence of God. But today, we're not going to flee any longer. We're not going to act like and we're not going to pretend like we can manipulate and make him happen. We're going to let him do what he wants to do today. Amen. So I'm going to ask that you stand with me right now and I'm going to pray. Uh, and at the end of this prayer, I'm going to ask our pastoral staff, Pastor Chip and Pastor Glenn and Pastor Tyler and Pastor Shelley uh, and, and Judy, and uh, it, they're going to come up here. And, and this morning, if you have any need, if, if, to, if today that you, maybe you're, 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 you're under the weather or you're discouraged or you're depressed, can I tell you something? Let's come to God and let him handle that today. Let, let's agree with one another and let's pray. And you say, Pastor, I could just pray. I get that. But you know what? These people, they're here and they want to pray with you. Maybe your marriage is a wreck or maybe you need to find Jesus today. Can I tell you something? You can find it and know that you know when you leave this place, it's not that you just said a little prayer. The Spirit can confirm it in your heart and life that you know that you've received and something has changed inside of you. So let, let's pray right now. I'm going to ask them to come, and, and then they're going, the band's going to play. And I'll officially dismiss everybody else. You can go today. If you'd like to hang around, you can. But if you need special prayer today, I'm going to ask you to come, and we're going to pray together. Lord, we're so thankful. My desire, Father, is for your Son to be glorified in undeniable ways. So we invite you to come into this place, heal the brokenhearted, mend marriages, deliver people from depression today. Lord, heal sick bodies today. Do all the things I know you're capable and able of doing. We agree with you, and as we agree with you, Lord, that you are full, you are rich in mercy and grace, that you express your mercy and grace today all through this place. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.